Hi everyone, thanks for joining and welcome to part two of this little introduction to bifurcation theory. So let me start by making a quick recap of part one. So I started with an example, which is the so-called logistic map given by this function here and depending on a parameter lambda. And what we're interested in is sequence of points where you fix a certain x naught and then you look at the sequence of xn that is defined by xn plus 1 is given by f lambda of xn and in particular what happens when n becomes large and one possibility is that you stay always at the same point and Maybe also you can converge to such a value, but you can also have more complicated dynamics. And what we did was to find so-called fixed points. So these are solutions of the equation x star is equal to f lambda of x star. And we found two of them. So one of them is given by x star equals 0 for all lambda, and the other one is given by x star is 1 minus 1 over lambda. That is the one we have here. And then we also looked at stability, and we found that, so what is plotted in green here, these are stable, meaning that they attract orbits that start nearby and the ones which are shown in red are unstable so they repel orbits starting nearby so all the, these are unstable and we have here two examples of bifurcation so one of them is here and the other one is here. So in the first bifurcation we have two so-called branches of fixed points that intersect and they exchange their stability. That is called the transcritical bifurcation. And in the second one a stable branch becomes unstable and actually what we showed is that there is a new orbit of period 2 that appears and that is stable near lambda equals 3 and actually when you look at the bifurcation diagram that you simulate uh, numerically you see that uh, in addition to this bifurcation here there is a lot actually an infinity of successive bifurcations until the dynamics becomes chaotic but we are interested in a general theory that allows to classify the types of bifurcations. And I gave two types of results. So the first one is called the implicit function theorem and what it gives us is a condition under which a branch of equilibrium points does not bifurcate. So what we are assuming here is that if we plot lambda like this and uh, x like this, then we assume that we have found a particular point lambda not x not on which f is equal to zero and then what this uh, theorem says is that if this particular derivative, the x derivative of f at this point is different from zero, then there is a unique equilibrium curve like this, x star of lambda that has value x naught at lambda naught and on which f is equal to zero. So by unique we mean the following thing, there's a certain 
neighborhood here of the point in which the only solution of f equals zero is given by this curve. But it is possible that we have other equilibrium points, uh, curves maybe down here, that is allowed. So what this result tells us is that it is the first type of bifurcation where we've seen the example where several curves are crossing can actually not occur if this condition on the derivative here is satisfied. And the other result I gave is called Newton's polygon. And it says that if I have an equation, so a function f of x lambda, which is has a certain Taylor expansion, so some coefficients a and m, x to the n, lambda to the m, and I plot the points in an m plane where a and m is different from zero. So I have graduations like this and I have a certain number of points maybe here and here and here and here and so on where a and m is different from zero, and then we construct a polygon by taking first the convex envelope of, of these points, which would be something like that, but then we complete it by a horizontal and vertical line like this. And then the Newton polygon is the boundary of this shaded area here, so it consists of these segments here. And then we saw that we have, we may have solutions, so equilibrium curves, x star of lambda, which are proportional to lambda to some power mu. And if this is the case, minus mu should be the slope of the segment of the polygon. So there's a certain segment here and another one here. They each have a slope and these are the possible values for me. And that allowed us to give a certain number of examples of simple bifurcations with a so a one-dimensional x and uh, find different possibilities for curves intersecting on which f is equal to zero. So today I want to talk about another method that allows to investigate these bifurcations and it's called normal forms. So let me uh, consider the case where we have a differential equation, x dot is f of x. For now, I'm not putting a parameter that will come a bit later. And here x can be in several dimensions. Let's say x is in Rd for some integer d. And let us assume that f of zero is equal to zero. So this means that zero is an equilibrium point. And assuming f is sufficiently regular, we can uh, make a Taylor expansion. So around x equals zero, so x dot will be given by ax plus some function b of x. And here a, that is, the Jacobian matrix of f at zero. So that is a d by d matrix containing all possible derivatives. And b is a nonlinear term and it has order norm of x squared. And our aim is to simplify as much as possible this b. So 
the idea is that we look for a change of variables, so x is equal to y plus g of y. Now the g of y we will take of order y squared also. And the question is, can we find g in such a way that the equation for y is simpler as the equation for x? So uh, to do that, what we do is that we plug this change of variable in this equation here, and we see what we get. And so what we get is identity matrix, which I write like this, plus Jacobian matrix of g at y times y dot, that is x dot, and that is given by what I get by replacing x on the right hand side by y plus g of y. So it is given by a times y plus g of y plus b of y plus g of y. And now if I multiply everything on the left by the inverse of this matrix here, assuming such an inverse exists, I will have found the equation for y dot. Now, what do we mean by simplify as much as possible? Well, ideally, we would like y dot to be equal to simply a times y. And that would be the case if the right hand side is given by, so I put again this matrix here, identity plus dy g of y times a times y. So if this is the case, we will have y dot equal a y, and that is a very simple equation to solve with matrix exponentials. Now this gives us a certain equation that G has to satisfy, but it's a very difficult equation to analyze because it's highly nonlinear, in particular due to this term here. And in fact, it is known that in many cases this equation cannot be solved. So what we do instead is that we solve a simpler equation that will not simplify the system that y satisfies as much as making it linear, but we will try to eliminate a certain number of nonlinear terms, in fact, as many as possible. Now, the observation here is that if g of y, actually, since g of y is of order y squared, its derivative here has order y. And that means that at least for y sufficiently small, I can indeed invert this matrix in brackets here, because it's close to the identity matrix. And that implies that its inverse will be given by Actually, it's the beginning of a geometric series, so it will be identity minus the derivative plus the remainder of order y squared. So if we plug this into the equation up here, so I forgot to write the inverse here. So if we multiply both sides by this inverse and then expand. And also we will use the fact that this thing here is equal to b of y plus terms of order y to the 3. So what we get is the following thing. So I just write the result. So y dot is equal to a times y plus a certain term given by b of y plus a times g of y minus 
the Jacobian matrix of G plus terms of order y to the 3. And what we would like to do is to simplify as much as possible this term that contains all quadratic terms in uh, the, the nonlinearity and possibly B contains some higher order nonlinearities, but if we just restrict to the quadratic terms, that is what we would like to simplify. So we can reformulate this problem as this. So it's called the homological equation. So if possible, we would like to solve this equation here. And if we do that, we will have a simpler equation, which would be y dot equals a times y plus some remainder, but which has order y to the 3. Now, can we solve this equation here? So, the first observation is that this left-hand side here, let me write this as Lg of y. So, given a certain g, I find a certain Lg of y. And the important point here is that L is, in fact, linear. It's a linear map acting on functions g. So, linear means that L acting on alpha g1 plus beta g2 is equal to alpha Lg1 plus beta Lg2 for any choice of functions g1, g2 and uh, real numbers alpha and beta. So, since L is linear, this is actually a problem in linear algebra. So, this equation here can be solved if and only if B belongs to the image of L. So the image of L is the set of all possible functions that we can get by applying L to a certain function G. And if B is in that image, we can solve the equation. And if B is not in the image, we can try to decompose it in part which is in the image and some complementary part. And we will be able to remove the part which is in the image. So we have to understand what this image looks like. And for that, it is preferable to make some assumptions on the matrix A. And let us assume that we are in dimension 2. So A is a 2 by 2 matrix. And let us assume that A is in dia diagonal form. So it has the form A1, 0, 0, A2, where A1, A2 are the eigenvalues of A. So that is always possible if the eigenvalues of A are different. And if the eigenvalues of A are the same, it may or may not be possible. So now let us look at uh, different functions g. So since L is linear, we can actually try uh, particular g's and then uh, just add the, the results we obtain. And remember that g had order y squared. And actually what we are going to do is to take the g which is homogeneous of degree 2. And that means that, for instance, g of y can have the form y1 to the power n plus times y2 to the power m and 0, where n plus m is equal to 2. So this will be what we call homogeneous of degree 2. And then what 
will LG look like? So, well, first I have to compute the Jacobian matrix. So that is given by n times yn to the n minus 1 times y2 to the m. That's the y1 derivative. And then I will have m times y1 to the n times y2 to the m minus 1. In the second row I will have zeros. And this I have to multiply by a times y, which is a1, y1, a2, y2. And then I have to subtract a times g of y, which is the vector a1 times y1 to the n times y2 to the m and 0. Now, if you make uh, the matrix multiplication here and you you simplify what you actually find is that you have n minus 1 a1 plus m a2 times y1 to the n y2 to the m n0 and that is nice because it's actually just a number times g so it is this number here, n minus 1, a1, plus m, a2, times g. In other words, this particular g here, this monomial, is uh, an eigenvector of my linear map L. And the eigenvalue is given by what is written here in brackets. And we can do a similar computation for g of y of the form 0, y1 to the n, y2 to the m. And what we find then is that Lg is equal to n times a1 plus m minus 1 times a2 times g. So we all have these other types of eigenvalues here. So what does it mean in terms of image and uh, uh, simplifying this uh, or solving this equation? Well, the question is whether these eigenvalues are equal to zero or not, because if some eigenvalues are zero, it means that the, the image is not the entire space and note that the the image of L acting on homogeneous functions of degree two is again the or it is at least contained in the set of functions which are homogeneous of degree two but it may be smaller if we have some of these eigenvalues which are equal to zero. So these are called resonant terms, so so-called resonant terms. Those are terms which are uh, not in the image of L. And then the normal form will have the following expression. So it will be y dot equals a y plus b2 of y, where this b2 here is resonant. And then we will have some remainder of higher order, of order y to the 3. However, we can again apply, apply the same technique, so we can try to now simplify terms of order 3 by looking at the same homological equation, but now acting on homogeneous functions of degree 3. And so there may be a remainder b3 of y consisting in resonant terms, 
that we cannot eliminate, and so on. So we can do this any finite number of times if things have a sufficient number of derivatives, and this gives us the normal form. So what we have gained by this is that instead of having a general equation, y dot is a y plus a general nonlinear term, we now have nonlinear terms that have a specific form. So they will in general be simpler than in the original equation. Now let us apply this to one-dimensional bifurcation points. So what I mean by that is that we have equations of the form x dot is f of x and lambda. And now x is a real number, lambda is a real number. So we have looked at systems like that in part one. And let us assume that f of 0, 0 is equal to 0, and dxf of 0, 0 is also equal to 0, because otherwise the implicit function theorem tells us that we have this unique branch of equilibrium points going through uh, the point 0, 0. And now one way of applying normal form theory to that is uh, the following trick. It is actually to uh, add, to consider lambda as a second variable, which is constant, so its derivative will be zero. And x dot, we can again expand it, so let me write it as a times lambda plus b of x lambda. So here a is equal to the uh, lambda derivative of f at 0, 0. And let us assume that this is different from 0, otherwise things get more complicated. And this b here is of order 2. So this means that b of x lambda will be smaller than some constant times x square plus lambda square. So this b can contain terms of order x square, but also x times lambda and lambda square. Now, this means that my system here is actually a system of the form x dot lambda dot is a certain matrix A times x lambda plus some nonlinear term. So let, let me just write it like this. So B of x lambda and 0, where A has the form 0, A, 0, 0. Now, if we want to simplify the, the B term here, the nonlinear term here, we can again look at this homological equation. And as we've seen before, it seems to be useful to look at homogeneous monomials. And one particular thing about this equation here is that we only want to simplify the x component because the lambda component is already equal to zero. So uh, let us look at the effect of this operator L on monomials of the form y to the n, lambda to the m, and zero. So This is not an equality, it's L acting on this. Now, uh, what is this? So first I have to put this Jacobian matrix, so which is given similarly to before by n times y to the n minus 1 times lambda to the n, 0, and 
uh, m times y to the n times lambda to the m minus 1, 0, times a lambda uh, times a uh, our, our vector, which is given by a lambda 0, and the other term is actually 0, 0 in this case because it's a times this vector which has a zero second component so we actually get zero and so if I perform the computation what I get is n times a times y to the n minus one times lambda to the n plus one zero So what this computation tells me is that if I take a homogeneous uh, G like that, what will be the effect of L? And all terms in B, which have the following form, we will be able to eliminate by this change of variable we've discussed before. Now. The observation here is that the terms we have here on the right hand side, they are actually uh, of the form, so the first component is of the form y to some exponent p times lambda to some exponent q, and uh, there's a certain constant in front. But the thing is that Q is always larger or equal to 1. So, for instance, if n plus m is equal to 2, so for 2, n equal 2, m equal 0, we can get uh, so y times lambda. And then for 1 and 1, we get lambda squared but we don't get y squared. So the point is that because of this q larger equal to one, we cannot get terms of the form y to some power without a lambda. So this implies that the resonant terms have the form y square, y to the three, and so on. All powers of y starting with power 2. So by applying the same idea as before, so first we try to simplify terms which are homogeneous of degree 2 and then 3 and so on, we find that the normal form, the normal form will be y dot equals a times y plus uh, C2, so uh, that's lambda, sorry, a times lambda, plus some coefficient C2 times y square, plus C3 times y to the 3, and so on. So what we have gained here is that in these, uh, in this expansion, apart from the linear term a times lambda, we have no more lambda. So we can actually uh, ignore the lambda dependence on the right hand side. And then we can study this with, uh, for instance, Newton's polygon, as we've seen before. And the generic case, so the, the most, the case that we will C most often is the case where C2 is different from 0, and then we get, as we have seen, what is called the saddle node bifurcation. So it's something where, depending on the signs, we, we have maybe one bunch of stable points and another bunch of unstable points, and they meet in a, in a fold like this. 
either for negative or for positive number. Okay, so now let us look at another case, which is called the Hopf bifurcation, which is a very important example of bifurcation. And now what we are going to assume is that we are in dimension two. And we look again at the system of form f dot is x dot is f of x and lambda. And we assume that f of 0, 0 is equal to 0, as before. And a is dxf of 0, 0. Now we are going to assume that it has purely imaginary eigenvalues. And since we assume that x is real, the coefficients of a are, are real numbers, it means that uh, the eigenvalues, if they are complex, have to be conjugate of each other. So we will assume that a has eigenvalues plus or minus i times omega with an omega which is different from zero. All right, so uh, first important observation here is that actually we are still in a situation where the implicit function theorem can be applied. Now in part one I gave a statement of the implicit function theorem when x is one dimensional. Now here x is two dimensional and what happens then is that actually we have a similar statement but the condition is now that this matrix here should be invertible. So if this matrix is invertible we have a similar conclusion on existence of a unique locally unique branch of uh, solutions. And since we assume here that A has these eigenvalues here and they are different from zero, it is the case that A is invertible. So we can apply the implicit function theorem. And it tells us that there exists a uh, smooth function x star of lambda such that x star of 0 is equal to 0 and f of x star of lambda lambda is equal to 0 at least for lambda small enough so in some neighborhood of lambda equals 0. Now uh, this means that we can actually uh, make the change of variable x is x star of lambda plus y and then we get a system of the form y dot is equal to so some matrix a of lambda times y plus b of y and lambda and this is uh, this has order norm of y squared. So it's similar to what we've uh, studied before. And a of zero will have these eigenvalues plus minus i omega. Now, we can apply now directly the theory of normal forms we have discussed before. Uh, However, uh, in order to solve this homological equation, it is actually useful to use complex notations, so complex variables. So let me say that z is equal to y1 plus i times y2. And that allows us to rewrite this system for y here as a system for z. So z dot will be a of lambda times z plus some remainder b of 
So then it's complex conjugate and lambda. And a of lambda will be the one of the eigenvalues of a. But yeah, be careful. I uh, so the nonlinear term, since it depends on y, so on y1 and y2, there's no reason in general that it will depend only on z. So it will be a function of z and its conjugate. And actually, we may also write the equation for z conjugate. So, but that that is just the conjugate of the equation for z. So, it doesn't really contain any new information. So, it is actually sufficient to consider just the first equation for z. So now we can apply our theory of normal forms. So look at this operator L in the homological equation and look at resonant terms. And since we have something which is uh, actually diagonal, the linear part is diagonal with uh, so this a uh, this z z bar system so okay so we have that z z bar dot is equal to matrix a of lambda zero zero a of lambda conjugate times z z bar plus nonlinear terms we can uh, look at these uh, conditions for terms being uh, resonant and actually the condition on being resonant will be strongest when lambda is equal to zero. So when lambda is equal to zero this matrix here is given by i omega zero zero minus i omega. And then uh, what are the, the resonant terms? Well, these are the terms, so I had this condition involving the eigenvalues and n and m. So they will be of the form zn, z conjugate to the power m, with n minus 1 i omega minus m i omega. So this is, remember, what I had here. Uh, this here with a1 is i omega and a2 is minus i omega. And this uh, should be equal to zero to be resonant, which means that actually n minus 1 minus m should be equal to zero. And now n plus m should be at least 2 because we have a nonlinear term. So what is the lowest order resonant term? Well, that is n equals 2 and m equals 1. So that is the term of the form z squared times z conjugate. So what does the normal form look like? It will be of the form, so I have a new variable, complex variable u. So u dot is equal to a of lambda u plus some c1 of lambda times u square times u bar. That is the first resonant term. And then you can see that actually there are no resonant terms of order 4 because this condition is cannot be satisfied if n plus m is equal to 4. So the next resonant terms will be of order u to the 5. So here we have something of order u to the 5. So this is now our normal form. So 
And we have shown that in appropriate coordinates, the system near lambda equal zero is given by this following expression. Now, how do we analyze this system? Well, it is actually useful to go to polar coordinates. So, so we can write that u is equal to r times exponential i theta. So r is the modulus of u and uh, theta is its argument. And then we find that u dot can be written as r dot plus i theta dot times r times exponential i theta. And this is equal to, to what? So uh, on the right hand side, we have a times u. So a times u, that is a times r times e i theta. And the next term will be c1 times u times its conjugate, times uh, or u squared times its conjugate. And that gives me c1 r to the 3. And then the nice thing is that I get exactly the same exponential, complex exponential part. And then higher order terms. So if you, you see that, that actually we can simplify all these exponentials here. Uh, so by multiplying this by e minus i theta. And what we get is, uh, if we split real and imaginary parts, we get the equation r dot is real part a of lambda times r plus real part c1 of lambda r cube plus higher order terms and theta dot is equal to imaginary part a of lambda plus imaginary part c1 of lambda times r square plus higher order terms. So the important thing here is that at lowest order, the equation for r is actually completely independent of theta. And now remember r a of lambda, these are the eigenvalues and the real part, uh, it actually uh, will be zero at zero. So we have real part a of zero is equal to zero. And, and what will be will happen in general is that real part a of lambda will be some uh, constant times lambda plus something of order lambda squared. So the real part will change sign. And if the real part of c1 of 0 is different from 0, what we have here is actually what we have seen before. It describes a pitch for bifurcation. So here we have the normal form of a pitchfork bifurcation. And on the other hand, theta dot, well, when r is small, it's uh, dominated by this term here. And the imaginary part of a of 0, that is omega. So the imaginary part of a of lambda, it will be omega plus something of order lambda. So that means that theta is basically just changing at uh, almost constant speed. So we have a, a rotation. So what does this mean for the system? Well, here is uh, one possibility. So it depends now on, on the signs of uh, these uh, real parts and the imaginary parts. So this is a case, so it is called the subcritical case. So it's the case where if I put here, uh, so lambda here and r here, 
it's the case where we have a pitchfork bifurcation like this, where we have a so the origin is unstable for negative lambda, and then it becomes stable for positive lambda, like this. So here we have uh, this is unstable here, and the green ones are stable. Like this and like this. So when R is negative, we have uh, two stable uh, branches for R, but actually uh, R cannot be negative, so we can just ignore what is happening here for negative R. So R will tend to uh, to this value here, which goes like square root of minus lambda, and theta, as we have seen, will just rot rotate. So this gives us here what is called a limit cycle, or a stable periodic orbit. So it's a particular solution that is uh, so periodic and attracting nearby solutions. And here in the center we have an unstable fixed point. And so, in fact, all orbits starting sufficiently close to the, uh, the origin will be attracted by the limit cycle, except if you start exactly at the origin, then you will stay there. So this is for lambda negative. Then for lambda equals zero, we are in this case here where actually all the orbits converge to zero, but they converge quite slowly because r dot here in this case r dot goes like minus a constant times r to the 3, so it gives us a decrease uh, that goes like 1 over the, uh, what is it, 1 over the square root of t, if I'm not mistaken. And for lambda positive, we are in this situation here where actually the origin is attracting exponentially. So here we will converge much, much faster to the origin. So that is the subcritical case, and there is another case which is called the supercritical case. And that is the case where the bifurcation looks like this. So here I'm always assuming that the origin is so So yeah, I'm assuming that the the orbit that is different from zero is uh, is stable. So that's actually what I do here. So here I have this thing here. where uh, I go from stable, attracting, to unstable, and I have the origin that is unstable. And what happens here is that we go from, uh, we go actually in the in the other direction. So we go from an attracting focus or an attracting point where, around which the orbits turn to something with uh, so with an, uh, a limit cycle, a stable limit cycle. Okay, but we can also have a version of the subcritical case where the stability is 
reversed, so we can also have this case here. So maybe that is what is more commonly called the subcritical case. So we have something like this. So a stable or origin that becomes unstable and it becomes unstable by actually absorbing an unstable limit cycle or unstable periodic orbit. And we have of course also for the supercritical case the version with the uh, stabilities which are exchanged. And this Hopf bifurcation is uh, a very important example of what happens in a dynamical system. So uh, an, an example that is often given, uh, given is called panel flutter. So if you have some shades in front of your window and it's made of uh, uh, many uh, parallel uh, kind of little blades and then when the wind, your window is open, the wind is blowing what can happen is that at some point these the shades, the blades start vibrating. And this appearance of vibration is actually a supercritical Hopf bifurcation like this one. So for the parameter is the wind velocity and for small velocity the station, uh, stationary state is stable and for larger velocity uh, the stable state is actually time periodic, it's a limit cycle, so that is the vibration. All right, so I want to finish with a, a last example, which is an example involving a double zero eigenvalue. So now uh, let me again look at dimension two. And x dot is equal to something of the form a times x plus b of x with b of order x squared. But now I assume that a has two eigenvalues equal to zero. And then there are two subcases, so we can compute the, the Jordan normal form of A, and it can be diagonal or not. And actually the simpler case is when A is not diagonal, so it has the form 0, 1, 0, 0. That is similar to what we've seen for the case of bifurcations with one zero eigenvalue. Uh, where we had a uh, coefficient a here instead of 1, but that can also always be transformed into, into, uh, into 1. And now let me look again at g of y of the form y1 to the n, y2 to the n, 0. So we've already actually computed the effect of this linear operator L on G's of this form. And so the result is, so let me write L acting on Y1 squared 0. So we will focus on linearities of degree 2. So then you find 2 Y1 Y2 0. Then for L acting on Y1, Y2, 0, you find Y2 square 0. And for L acting on Y2 square 0, you find 0, 0. So this is uh, what, what we've uh, seen before that uh, sometimes you can get zero so actually what we've seen before is that we could eliminate terms which depend on uh, on lambda but not a term that depends only on y okay but here we have also the possibility of taking 
monomials of the following form. And then let me just write what you get if you do the computation. So uh, 0 y1 squared will be mapped to minus 1 1 y1 squared 2 y1 y2 L acting on 0 y1 y2 is given by minus y1 y2 y2 squared and L acting on 0 y2 squared is given by minus y2 squared 0 All right, so um, in terms of linear algebra, what happens here is that actually the space of homogeneous functions of degree 2 has a finite dimension, which is 6, because we it is spanned by the 6 functions we fear, y1 square 0 and so on. There are 6 functions. So, so we are actually in a in a space of dimension six. And now the question is, what is the rank of L? So what is the dimension of the image of L? So that is called the rank of L. So it's the dimension of the image of L. And well, you see one vector here is sent to zero so the dimension cannot be six it is at most five but then we also have two vectors here which are have images that are collinear so that means that actually the the web can be at most four and then you can check that actually the the other vectors you get here so you can pick four vectors here which are linearly independent. So the conclusion is that the rank is equal to 4. And this means that we uh, will be able to eliminate uh, in the nonlinearity a subspace of dimension 4. But the resonant part is actually a subspace of dimension 2. Now, we have actually some choice in how we choose the, uh, the resonant terms. There's uh, some freedom in the choice of basis. So, you see, what we saw up here is, well, we can always eliminate terms of, uh, of order of the type y2 squared and y1, y2. But with g's of uh, the form up here, we were not able to uh, eliminate terms of order, so of the form y1 squared 0. However, thanks to this term, we can actually do that. So we can remove terms of order y1 squared, but at the cost of producing something of order y1, y2. So we have to make a choice. So either we eliminate all possible terms of order 2 in the first component, but at the cost of not being able in general to eliminate mixed terms in the second component, or we can eliminate terms in the second component, but uh, there's something remaining in the first one. And in the second component, you see that we will never be able to eliminate y1 squared. So now uh, the choice is up to us. So a possible normal form will be b of y. So we can choose to eliminate all terms of order 2 in the first component. But then in the second component, well, we will have a certain C1 times 
y1 squared, because we cannot eliminate y1 squared, plus some c2 times y1, y2. Right, so that is a possible normal form, or the other possibility would be to have to keep something of the form c2 times uh, so it was y1 squared here. So that is up to us, whatever is more convenient. So the normal form will be like this, but with b having a form like this or like that, and then higher order terms of order 3. So let us make the choice here. So this is now the normal form and I call variables x again where I've made the first choice. So here I have my two resonant terms and then in principle there, there will be terms of order x to the 3. And this is at the bifurcation point. So now we want to look at lambda at parameter dependent systems and see what happens then. So now we will add some lambda dependent terms. And before we have already seen cases where there, there's one parameter lambda and we get different systems depending on uh, the sign of lambda. But here it turns out that this is actually what is called a dimension of uh, bifurcation of co-dimension 2, which means that one parameter will not be enough to find all possible small perturbations of this system here. And so this is something I'm not going to, to explain in detail why this is true, but it is true that one way of looking at an unfolding, so at parameter dependent perturbations of the system that will capture all possible behaviors, is the following one. So, in fact, we can always assume that x1 dot is x2 because this is in effect a second order system, right? So, so this is the same as second derivative of x1 is equal to x1 square plus x1 times x1 dot. And here you have something similar with these extra terms in lambda 1 and lambda 2. So you can always uh, arrange that the equation for x1 dot has this form here. And then here there are two parameters lambda 1 and lambda 2 that describe all possible small perturbations of the system. So let us look at uh, the system in a bit more detail. So first of all, what are the fixed points? So the right hand side should be zero, so x2 should be equal to zero. So here I get lambda 1 plus zero plus x1 squared is equal to 0. So this gives me x1 equals square root plus minus square root of minus lambda 1, but it's only possible if lambda 1 is negative. So what I, I'm saying here is that if lambda 1 is negative, we actually have two fixed points. And if lambda 1 is positive, there are no fixed points. And then when you, if you have these fixed points, you can look at their stability. And so what happens here is uh, the following thing. So if lambda 1 is here on uh, the abscissa, lambda 2 is on the ordinate. And all this yellow region, we have no no equilibrium point. And on this vertical axis, we have actually 
saddle node bifurcations. And what happens is that on this side you we will always have actually uh, one point which is a saddle with one unstable and one stable direction and the other point which is a focus and then if you look at the stability you find that actually for positive lambda 2 the the focus is unstable so you get something like this so an unstable focus and uh, the saddle and then the orbits do something like this now down here you find that the focus is actually stable so dynamics will look something like this and then the other orbits do something like this so between these two cases with a stable and unstable focus we must have a bifurcation and actually if you compute the eigenvalues you find that here there's a line with a Hopf bifurcation. So it's a Hopf bifurcation where uh, actually the, the focus here becomes stable and it expels an unstable periodic orbit. So what happens there is that we have something like this so we will have an unstable periodic orbit here and then we have as always we have this saddle point here and the orbits here are repelled by this focus or by this uh, unstable periodic orbit and inside we have our stable focus. So this is now stable. It's actually turning the other way around, like this. Okay, but now you see that between these two situations, up here and down here, there's actually, there must be another bifurcation because here we have a periodic orbit up here and down here we don't have it. And that's the interesting thing about this bifurcation is that actually you can show just by this local analysis of stability that there is a, an additional bifurcation and this bifurcation is called a homoclinic bifurcation. So what we have is here we have a saddle node bifurcation, here we have a saddle node bifurcation, here we have a Hopf bifurcation, and here we have uh, an additional bifurcation, which is called homoclinic bifurcation. And I've plotted a number of vector fields here. So one here that is on, on the right hand side when there's no equilibrium point at all. So we just have some type of uh, vector field without equilibrium points. Then the case two and the case four are these cases that you get after a saddle node bifurcation with a focus and a, a saddle. As I've drawn in the case three is the, the case with the unstable periodic orbit. So A is the situation when we are ex exactly on the saddle node bifurcation line. So in that case, we have here a kind of degenerate uh, equilibrium point. And C is also, uh, oh, D here is also saddle node bifurcation. 
B is the Hopf bifurcation. And the new bifurcation here is this C, which is called a homoclinic bifurcation. So what happens here is when you go through the Hopf bifurcation, there's a small periodic orbit, which is unstable, that appears. And when you approach the homoclinic bifurcation, so for instance, lambda 2 decreases, this unstable periodic orbit becomes larger and larger until it reaches the saddle point here. So we have here what is called a homoclinic orbit, and I've mentioned them in a previous talk on uh, chaotic systems. So this red unstable periodic orbit at some point becomes a homoclinic cycle and then this cycle breaks and uh, we are back in the situation number four here. And in the middle we have this situation, so the, in the middle that is the normal form when lambda 1 equals lambda 2 equals 0. So it's a vector field that has one equilibrium point here in the center. But what we see is that we can perturb this in any of these eight qualitatively different vector fields we find there. All right, so that was uh, this more advanced look into bifurcation theory. So we've seen uh, the most important bifurcations with one parameter. And the most important example for differential equations of a bifurcation with two parameters. And uh, people have looked at many more scenarios which are more complicated with uh, where you need more parameters. All right, that's it for today. I hope I hope you liked it. So thanks a lot for watching. Take care. Bye.